And um, just to finish off, and we may, we may go just a couple minutes over, but we have um, two human rights experts with us. Uh, Sonia Samtani, who's on the law faculty at University of Oxford, finishing her, her PhD there, and uh, Beatrice Bosuniche, uh, who's at the Foundation Via Libre in, in, uh, in Argentina. And so, Sonia, maybe you could start off and, and Beatrice uh, add any comments, but what we started off with the why trips. And now I wonder if you could bring us into um, why human rights? Uh, what, what, is, what is the intersection between human rights law and the copyright issues that we're hearing about today? Sonia? Thanks so much, Sean. Um, so my research, um, along with other things, demonstrates how the institutional features of the WTO, in particular respect of enforcing the TRIPS agreement, causes a chilling effect upon member states that are seeking to make use of the flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement in their domestic copyright laws to realize human rights. So the chilling effect that takes place or that I demonstrate essentially uh, is something that's demonstrable in South Africa at the moment that Denise talked about a little bit. Um, and so it is quite interesting to see how this is playing out in the world right now. Um, in any event, the TRIPS agreement, particularly through WTO membership has near universal application around the world. But it must not be forgotten that at the same time, the, IC the ICESCA, that is the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, also has near universal application with about 174 states parties. Um, and that means that members of the WTO are also party, most members of the WTO are also party to the ICESCA. Um, the TRIPS agreement, particularly in their objects in Article 7 and 8, map on to binding human rights law under the ISESCO and other UN human rights treaties as well. And so as everyone else has also demonstrated, the waiver is key for states to fulfill their human rights obligations in the global pandemic. Um, particularly the situation at hand is an important example of the indivisibility and the interrelatedness of human rights. So um, as others have demonstrated in order to properly fulfill everyone's right to the highest attainable standard of health, States must also realize everyone's rights to freedom of expression, particularly to receive and impart information, again, related to two rights in two ways. First, the right to equitable access to scientific knowledge and the applications of scientific and technological advancements, particularly in order to facilitate urgent innovation. Of course, in respect of vaccine development and treatments, but also in relation to global universal vaccination and access to medicines, of course. This right is protected by the ISESCO and states have obligations in respect of realizing this right um, under the Respect, Protect and Fulfill framework as well. The second way that I mentioned previously would be access to education materials in order to, of course, facilitate containment and prevention of COVID-19. We've heard Denise and Teresa speak a lot about that just now. Um, just to add to that, access to educational materials under copyright for educational purposes is particularly guaranteed under international human rights law under the right to education. And in relation to primary education, it is a minimum core obligation for states. So states are bound to provide textbooks in relation to primary education. And so as everyone else has also already demonstrated, in addition to unequal internet access, copyright of course forms a major barrier to accessing educational materials remotely because of paywalls, restrictive numerical limits on the number or extent of copies in some countries, laws, and that limits the realization of this right to education. Um, and so, yeah, I, that's all I have to say. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Beatrice. Beatrice, do you want to, yes, to hi. follow up? Yeah, thank you. Yes, just a, a short statement. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you, Sonia. I, I fully agree with what she already said, so I, I, I will not repeat that. Um, but I, what I would like to stress in this in this uh, uh, short uh, paragraph is that human rights has a, 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 it's more important than every commercial 
trade policy, whatever it takes, uh, the states have an obligation with human rights. In Latin America, I'm based in Argentina, but this is the case for the rest of the region. Um, human rights are included in our constitutions. And we have to think that intellectual property is a public policy uh, to promote the development of science and culture. But the main, main task every state should, should comply with is human rights. So if intellectual property is blocking the obligation of the states to comply with their human rights commitments, we have to think uh, that human rights have a, a preeminence on every uh, obligation within the trade agenda and that's not something i am saying or we are saying it's something that it is already stated in the human rights uh, uh system i um, it's 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 an obligation to comply with human rights so if you have to change a public policy like for example, intellectual property laws, uh, then every state should start thinking about uh, doing something like that to comply with the human rights obligations that every every uh, state that is a party of the human rights conventions uh, should comply. So thank you, Sean, and thank you all the colleagues for uh, stressing these issues in this in this opportunity. Thank you, and and thank you to all our speakers and participants. This is going to end our our.